My name is Dave Morrow. Nine months of each year, I live out of my vehicle. I travel the wilderness by foot on an endless backpacking and landscape photography trip. I want to teach and share the photography and outdoor skills that I use on these trips. I don't want to spend hours editing video or sitting in front of a computer, so I made some rules. First, everything shot on GoPro. This was the best way I found to record quickly on a consistent basis. Second, I can only spend 20 minutes editing each video. So thanks for watching, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Journals. All right, guys, welcome to the answer session for my Ask Me Anything that I put out last week. I got a bunch of good questions from everybody, and I'm going to go through and answer some of the top ones that got the most thumbs up, and then I also picked ones from the bottom of the list as well that didn't get any thumbs up. Because what normally happens is the first people to submit their questions on the first day I put the video out, everybody thumbs up those. So there's normally questions that are really good towards the bottom that just got submitted later that didn't get the thumbs up. So I try to pick through both and give you guys some good stuff that you'll like the answers to or you can learn from. And I also wanted to tell you guys that this is the last video that I'll be putting out for a while. I am headed down to Utah for a two month backpacking, photography, and rafting trip with my buddy Iron. And then we will be back up here in the Pacific Northwest the entire summer doing mountaineering, backpacking, and rafting. So next year, or late in this year, I might put out some new videos. I have to decide on my next project that I'm going to put out. So we will see if I make new YouTube videos then or not. But I will definitely let you guys know when I put out a new project some way or another. Probably be later this year or early next year. We will see when that comes out. But let's get to these questions. For some reason, I didn't bring a tripod to hold this GoPro on, so I'm just going to brace it off my knee. So here's the first question. It says, Dave, have you ever used Lee filters? Why or why not? If so, could you do a video on your filter techniques? So the answer to this is easy. I don't use any filters that have neutral density. I use a circular polarizer for both of my lenses, and if you guys want to see the circular polarizer lenses that I use or the filters that I use, you can check out my camera gear page, which I will link below this video. My reason for not using ND filters, I really don't find them to be necessary for what I do in landscape photography. I can usually get the longer exposure I need just by increasing my f-stop. And you can check out my long exposure water technique video, and that kind of gives you a gist of the technique I use for shooting long exposures, rivers, streams, anything else where I want to control the shutter speed, but I don't want to use an ND filter. So I'm doing all of my trips as wilderness photography trips, so any extra weight I can cut off or shed, I'm going to do that automatically. So ND filters don't make any sense for what I do. I could see how they would be helpful, but they're also something else you have to learn. So if you can perfect your craft or get better at your craft, and as you do so, cut out all the stuff you don't 100% need, that's gonna help you a lot. And I found that I don't 100% need ND filters, so I cut them out of my life. Now that won't work for everybody, but that's just my personal preference. The next question is, I don't rec uh, this one is from Conrad Ernest. I don't recall in any of your videos how you manage power needs in the backcountry. If you are so inclined, I like to hear how you do so. So for power, a lot of people like to carry solar chargers. I find that solar chargers are a huge failure mode. If you only carry a few batteries for your whole trip and you're depending on a solar charger to work, if your solar charger fails, then the rest of your trip is gone as far as photos go. So what I do is I carry a single battery for each day of my backpacking trip. So if I go out for eight, 10 days, I'll carry eight or 10 batteries. Now, as far as charging my GoPro and as far as charging my phone, I just use a smartphone for my backcountry navigation. I carry a 10,000 mAh anchor power brick for every seven days of the trip. So if I go on a seven day trip, I'll carry one of those power bricks. If I go on a 14 day trip, I'll carry two of them. And I will link that anchor power brick below so you can check it out. But essentially you can just charge it up and you can plug it into the USB on a phone. You can plug it into the GoPro, which I use, and you can charge it up that way. And then as far as shooting in the field goes, I just carry a charged battery for each day of that trip. So I like to keep it really simple. Now when I get back to my vehicle after a long trip, I normally take a day and I have an inverter in my vehicle. So I'll plug in all my batteries and I'll get everything recharged and then I'll go back out on a long backpacking trip. Um, here's another question. It says, what 
What's been the most precarious, dangerous situation you've had to extract yourself from while on a photography trip? So I think there's a really big misconception that if you're going out in the backcountry, if you're going out on expeditions where you're traveling by foot in the wilderness, that it's dangerous. Now it can be dangerous if you don't know what you're doing, and it can also be dangerous if you don't really think through your actions. So if you're going out on these trips and you're performing at a high level, and you are up to date with all the current knowledge that you should have about the specific trip you're doing. You have backcountry first aid knowledge. You have all the knowledge for the specific, specific environment you're going into. You should not be getting hurt or injured. You should be walking a fine line between the very edge of what your limits are, but you should never be going over that line. If you're getting hurt or injured a lot, or you're getting into trouble a lot in the backcountry, it means you don't know what you're doing you're not planning correctly, or you don't have the correct knowledge for the application that you need it for. So I've never really been in a really dangerous situation because I always think through every step I'm about to take, if it's gonna be dangerous. If it's gonna be dangerous, which it is sometimes is, I always have backup plans to mitigate that risk in any way possible. So what I would highly recommend everybody do, if you're gonna come out here, take this GoPro off my leg for a second, lean back. <clears throat> If you're going to come out and do wilderness trips, I would highly recommend doing certification in called what's called a wilderness first responder. This is a 10 day first aid training course. It goes through like all the basics of first aid and what you need when you have no backup for medicine out in the backcountry. So that's good. It's called a WFR or wilderness first responder. I would also highly recommend taking avalanche course. It's called AIRE or whatever they call it in specific countries, just your basic avalanche awareness course. It's normally two to five days, depending on how deep you wanna get in that. Um, I would also recommend taking a mountaineering course if you wanna get into climbing. A climbing course, a basic glacier travel course, any of these things that are kind of regimented and have a step-by-step-by-step -step -step process. And it's almost a science for a lot of these things. When you're coming out here, and that's why I really like backpacking in the outdoors because I can mix my past experience as an engineer where we really had everything step by step by step specced out. And I can mix it with the creativity of backpacking and coming out here in the wilderness and doing things that I really like. So I've never really been in any precarious situations because I know where my limits are. I push those limits all the time, but I also have the training and backup plans in place. So I know if I go beyond that limit and I get hurt, I can extract myself from it. But I can foresee very well what my limits are and I know how far to push them. So anybody that's bragging about getting hurt a lot or anybody that's bragging about all these scare stories that they have out in the wilderness, that's not a good thing to brag about. You are basically telling people that you're not well educated in what you're doing. The best climbers to ever live have a few stories, but none of them are telling you any stories about their death because they're telling you the story. So if you wanna have a long career in the wilderness, you need to have the training ability and you need to have the knowledge out here where you're not gonna get into those situations. So I can't recommend enough how important training is before you come out here. And you can find places all over the world that will get you started in backpacking, mountaineering, climbing, rafting, anything else that you'd like to do out here. Um, another course that's great is Swift Water Rescue for rafting. So that's a great question. I haven't been in any, so I don't have any really great stories on that front, and I'm glad I don't. Um, here's a question that's a good one. It says, how do you make a living slash afford to travel so much, and how do you balance relationships while traveling so much? So that's kind of like a two-part question, right? So how do I make a living? I kind of covered this a little bit in my video where I talked about why I'll never do freelance photography. So basically over the past around eight years, I've been building a website and a knowledge platform that creates what is called passive income. So passive income doesn't mean you just get free money. A lot of people hear passive income and they're like, oh, this must be a scam. Passive income means that you build into a system and you constantly work on the system to make it larger and larger and larger and provide people with more and more helpful information. But you can step away from that system for long periods of time and it continues to make money just as it did when you're putting information into it. So basically my website and my income are designed so I can build my website and my knowledge base and my information system that I use to get people tons of free knowledge and paid high level premium tutorials. I build that for three months out of every year and then I get to go travel for nine months and during those nine months 
is the break time where I get to generate new ideas for the projects that I want to build the next year. So while I'm gone for those nine months, that passive income system continues to generate money just like it does when I'm home. So every year when I come back, I decide the next project that I'll build and I build that passive income system bigger and I get more people to come and learn from it. So in turn, my revenue goes up and up. So I'm not trading time for money, meaning I'm not getting paid per job or dollar per hour. I'm taking the huge risk of saying, I have this vision of something I wanna build out. And slowly over time, I'm building it and building it and building it. And it took about five years of building it before I was making a profit. Now, after I hit that profit mark, it started going up a lot faster. And once you start to see these systems go up, they kind of start at a really low curve like this. And if you do it right, once they kind of hit that inflection point, like right in here, they'll start to shoot up a lot faster. As more people start to spread the word about what you're doing, as more people start to tell their friends, hey, this guy is good stuff, you should go learn from him. The word spreads and your knowledge or whatever you're providing people gets out there and you'll see the income go way up. So I don't really trade time for money. I trade my time for the future value of what I think I can build into this system. So once I started making a profit, probably it's been about four years ago, it started making pretty good profits. I left my job at Boeing and I was doing aerospace engineering at Boeing. And I left my job, not on a risk, but I left my job when my photography business started making more than my job. So I could pay myself more than the Boeing engineer salary was. And I felt at that point, seeing that happen for two years, I was ready to get out and leave. So once that happened, it's still a nerve wracking experience because you're leaving the stability of healthcare, 401k, all this other stuff. And you can set that up within your own business, but you have to learn how that whole backside of the business runs. So it's not for everybody. I'm not saying it's the best way to make a living. And I'm not saying that an engineering job is not a great job to have. I just couldn't do the nine to five desk job. And I'm very motivated by designing things in my mind and then slowly building them out into systems that I can see work for me in real life. And building this passive income slash knowledge based system that I have on my website is really kind of the mixture of engineering and photography and art all into one thing. So it's a lifelong goal of mine. It's not something that I'm saying, hey, I'm going to spend my 30s having fun and traveling. Actually, I'm spending my 30s building up the foundation for this huge system that is going to help me have income in my 40s, 50s, 60s, however long I live because it's slowly building layer after layer after layer of this foundation. And as the foundation gets larger and larger and larger, it not only helps more people gain free knowledge and free learning material, as you see all over my website and all in the YouTube videos, it also helps people to get access to my really high level content, which are paid courses like I just put out about three weeks ago. So it's always going, the passive income system's moving all the time, sales are always happening, and it doesn't require me to constantly have input into the system. So I think a lot of people had that question and that's why I went pretty deep on it. Um, but you can look up, uh, when I started out, there was a few resources I used to learn from. I didn't go to any special class. I did have a background in mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering, so that helped with the problem solving mindset. But people are always asking me how to get in to what I do. Uh, you can learn yourself, but I, it's very hard for me to tell you how to do it because having a background in engineering, I already had a really good framework for problem solving. So I feel like it's gonna be hard to say, hey, just read these articles and go do it if you don't have a problem solving mindset already. So when people are not, let's say you're like 18 and you're about to go to college or something, or you're like, should I go to college or should I do photography full time? You could go do photography full time if you wanted to. Um, I always recommend to people that if you don't know what you wanna do, go get a four year hard science degree, meaning a degree in engineering, uh, a degree in physics, a degree in the medical sciences. I would highly recommend over all those a degree in some sort of engineering or computer science engineering. Now what these engineering curriculums teach you to do is they teach you to solve problems at the highest level in the most efficient way possible. And they also provide you with a really good income after four years. So you could go to an engineering school and it will be hard as hell. It was some of the hardest times in my life for sure. 
But if you go to that school, they will teach you how to solve problems at the highest level. And you can apply these problem solving skill sets throughout the rest of your life. So if you have the means to go to college for four years and you don't know what you want to do, I would highly recommend getting better at photography, but to go to college for engineering or physics or computer science so you can teach yourself how to solve problems. Because people that know how to solve problems are always going to be able to make a living for themselves. Because everywhere you go, people need people to solve problems for them. And if you can solve those problems, you can take this knowledge base that you have and you can do anything you want with it. You can build a business like I did with it. You can stay with an engineering job if you end up liking that engineering job. You can do anything else you want. But the nice part about going to get that four-year engineering degree, as soon as you get out, if you did well in college, you will make probably almost six figures. This is in U.S. dollars or close to it. And then you'll be making mid six figures by 10 years into it. So it's not all about money. But if you want to fund a company and you want to get out of the nine to five, having an engineering job giving gives you the problem solving ability to do so and the money to fund it. So I basically bootstrapped this entire company that you see on my website now because first place I had an engineering job that could fund that building the business and my life at the same time. Without that I would have had to look for investment from other places and take loans and I didn't want to be in debt. So my goal when I was 18 was to work for myself and have my own business by the time I was 30. And I saw the quickest method to do that was, first of all, learn how to solve problems at the highest level. How did I learn to do that? Go to engineering school. I also needed, second problem, funding to start my business. Engineering school provided quick access to funding given I got that five-year degree. I got a mechanical degree and an aerospace degree. But given I got that five-year degree, I could fund that whole thing. So that was the quickest path to me getting funding and problem-solving ability to build my own business. And at 29, I was able to quit my nine to five and have a business that was matching my engineering salary. So I wasn't quite as nervous. Now I'm still nervous to run my own business. There's a lot of stress that's involved with it. But as far as that goes in my long winded answer to the passive income, that's how my start to finish thought process went from when I was 18 years old to now I'm 33 years old, almost 34 and the flow between each time. Um, this one says, hi Dave, what are the biggest misconceptions of landscape photography you wish you would have known much earlier? Oh, so there's a few big ones here. Um, I think the first big one is that I always thought there was some secret formula that all these pro photographers had that made their images look so good or their work look so good. And really that secret form formula is hard work and the time or hours spent performing their craft. So. There's not a secret formula. There's not like a secret photo editing trick or secret shooting technique. The secret formula is putting in hour after hour of work and not lazy work. Work where you're constantly questioning your process, you're constantly thinking to yourself, and you're constantly trying to make yourself better over time. And if you're putting in those hours every single day, year after year after year, then you're going to get better. When I was talking about that my photography business didn't show a profit for the first five years, I knew in my mind from having the background in engineering that if you put into a system and you build it smart and you have a good underlying idea of what you want to get out there to people, if you put your head down and get to work and make sure it's justified and sound, that it will work in the long run. So when I'm hitting like two, three, four years and it's starting to make money but it's not hitting profit yet, I was thinking, man, I hope it does it soon. I just kept my nose to the grindstone and kept pushing into it and finally started to turn a profit. Um, so I think the same thing happens with shooting and photography or editing photos. You have to realize that the photos that you see of people that you look up to, they are probably six to ten years of hard work ahead of you. And that's the bridge between you and them. So the only way to get there is put in the time, put in the effort, and put in the practice and constantly do it. There's no secret um, besides hard work and time. Um, what else? Oh, okay. Here's another misconception that I had that, and I wasted a whole lot of time doing this, that you need social media to do well in the photography game. Um, now, social media is a tool that came around, I don't know, when was it? 2004 or six or something, it started to come out. I was in college when Facebook first came out for only college students, but it was uh, 
it was something I jumped onto right away because it was new and nothing had been like it before. And I wasted six years of my life building an audience in social media. And it's not all waste because you have great interactions with people. But if you go to my uh, video on gatekeepers, um, I forget what I title it. I'll link it below this video. I talk about how you always want to have direct contact with your audience, meaning an email list or something where you can actually say something and it gets directly to your audience. Social media doesn't allow you to do that because they control the gate between your audience and you and they can limit what your audience sees that you put out. So I wish I would have started using the ways to generate traffic and audience that I am now a lot, lot longer ago. And right now I use my website which generates traffic from Google search results. So Google is still kind of the gatekeeper. But what happens with Google being the gatekeeper is they want to give the most relevant information at the top of the search. So if you can provide the best, highest level, most relevant information, they will serve it up top because it can correlate to the things they want to search or sell with their advertising. Um, so they all work off ad models, which is unfortunate. I really wish there was a way where the whole thing could be done by people that care about specific creators or specific artists could pay them directly each month or have a subscription fee or something like that and that was the going way to do things but some things are starting to move that way not everything is um, but I don't use social media anymore I think that was a big waste of my time I didn't feel good being there I'm not saying that that's not going to apply to everybody but for me it wasn't um, another misconception that you have to sell prints to make a living doing photography I like taking photos a lot. I like the process of photography more than anything. If I can mix going out on long wilderness trips and backpacking with photography, I'm extremely happy. That's all I want to ever do, even for like the next 20, 30 years. So selling prints really got in the way of things I enjoyed. I wanted to get people prints on their walls. I like to see people enjoy the photos, but people can do that on my website. I know it's not the same. But I stopped selling prints because there was a lot of time between the person ordering the print and then the back and forth contact to make sure the person got a really good print. And I didn't want to all constantly spend my life just interacting, making sure somebody got the print that they wanted. I wanted to be able to spend my time teaching people how to take photos, teaching people how to edit their photos, backpacking, and going on long distance photography trips along with backpacking. So I removed prints from all of my income about three years ago and I never looked back. You can just take that time that you're using to do prints and put it somewhere else. I just didn't find that unless you're charging like $1,500 or $2,000 a print, the time involved to get the print out to somebody to make sure it's perfect and make sure that they have a really good experience purchasing the print is just not worth it. You're trading time for money again and I wanted to do the passive income where I could build a system and it could scale up because I can get it to one person or a million people with the same amount of ease so long as I have the audience there. So I took prints out of there. I just didn't enjoy the process of getting people to print. I enjoyed seeing the person have the print, which is great, but I didn't enjoy all the logistics between them ordering and them getting the print. It's just not for me, so I took that out. Um, last misconception, then I'll move on, that you need to network or hang out with photographers or pay attention to current photography trends or like photography news sites. So you can hang out with no photographers if you want to. And if you push yourself and you always question yourself of what looks good and you're constantly looking at the old landscape painter, painters and the old artists and just common trends from the past that will kind of shape your eye to see what is good in composition, what is good in color, and what is good in light, you can kind of train your eye to see that. And once you work on your photos over a long period of time, your photos will get better and better and better. So I would highly recommend to people, at least this worked for me, it might not work for you, but I don't do any networking for photography. I have a few people that I go out backpacking with that also take photos. My buddy Iron and I do most of our trips together and we throw ideas off of each other, but we don't really critique each other's photos. We kind of just put our heads down, we work and we constantly just judge ourselves as hard as possible. And I guess I should just speak for myself, but I'm always judging my work and trying to make it better and picking out what's bad in it. And I don't really want to be involved in the logistics of having to coordinate to talk with a network of other photographers. There's just too much noise in between for getting any worth out of it for me. I would rather spend my time out here 
and actually working on the craft rather than talking about how I could improve the craft. So the time involved and the time to get better is where I want to spend all my time, not the time talking about how I'm going to get better. So I'm just constantly editing photos when I'm home. I'm constantly shooting and questioning my techniques when I'm out in the backcountry. And if I always question myself and I always look at what's worked in the past, you can check out painters like Albert Bierstadt. You could check out any of the uh, old old school photographers. And the reason I say old school is not because there's no good new school photographers, but you don't have to keep up with all this social media noise to follow the old school photographers. You can just go to their website and view their body of work. You can also just go to anybody's website and if they have a really good website you want to study their work, you can say, oh, what do I like about this work? What don't I like about this work? And kind of try to mold yourself off of there. But I don't really get involved with like any networking with other photographers um, unless it happens randomly which doesn't really happen uh, that, I mean that's advice for some people it'll work well for some it won't work for others um, how do you store back up your images in the field especially on a long trip good question so when I'm going out on like a 14 day trip I just take memory cards that will suffice for the whole time I'm out so I have a Nikon D810 which I shoot with it has a CF card slot which I put a CF card in, 32 gigabyte, and then it has an SD card slot. I use the SD card to back up the CF. So as soon as the CF photo takes, it backs up to the SD card. Now I know that's double the cards I have to take, but if one card fails, I still have it on the other card. So that lasts me for the entire trip. When I get back from say a 14 day trip, I'll get to my vehicle and I have two one terabyte hard drives. I'll plug the SD card into my computer, which holds all the photos it'll back up to one of those hard drives and then I have a program called carbon copy cloner that clones it to the other hard drive so now I have one hard drive with all the photos another hard drive with all the photos that is cloned so now I can erase all my memory cards and I have it backed up on two specific hard drives one of those hard drives I keep hidden in my vehicle the other of those hard drives since they're pretty small one terabyte drives I carry in my backpack and on me all the time in a little waterproof ziploc bag so that way I can mitigate if anybody robs my car I don't lose my entire photo repository because I have that backup drive with me so that's how I take care of photos while I'm out on the road and then when I get back home I integrate them into my entire workflow system and start to go through them there but I don't organize or edit while I'm out on these long trips it's like my time away from the computer where I can just think of new ideas uh, get better at photography, get better at backpacking, and think of things that I want to create next as far as videos or written guides and stuff like that go. Um, Dave, you have a GoPro for all your videos. What settings do you use for this device? So, and it also says, uh, it seems to be amazingly stabilized. So I use the GoPro Hero 7 now. That's what I'm shooting this on. It has automatic stabilization, which is really good. I used to use the GoPro Hero 4 with a Fiutech gimbal, which also worked really well. It's just a lot more gear to carry. So the GoPro Hero 7, I shoot on ProTune. Uh, for color, I shoot on the flat color pro profile, not the GoPro color profile. And then I put the EV or exposure value on negative one. And then I put the max ISO at 800. And everything else I leave nominal. I leave white balance on auto, unless it looks really funky on the back of the screen and then I'll change it or adjust it with Kelvin but pretty basic settings and then I just turn it on and record. And I also use a mic with this GoPro. So if you want to check out my whole GoPro setup, I will link my list of all my gear, which I have on my website. Um, it has all my backpacking, photography, and camera gear. And I'll link that below this video. Good question though. Um, I know you, uh, this one is just says, how do you calibrate your monitors in short? It's longer than that, but that's what it says. I use a data color spider elite. I have the Spider Elite Pro 4, and that's like five years old or something, but there's a newer version you can get now. Um, I can link it below. The Spider Elites work very well. It's just a hardware device you put on your screen, and then it runs software on the computer, and it matches the color to true color on your screen. I use that once every six months. I will link that below this video. Um, this one says, as a newbie with an entry-level Nikon D3400, I've tried to get tack sharp photos. I must have watched hundreds of hours of video. I'm still getting mostly poor quality images using a tripod, focus stacking, focus distant apps, and test shot cards. Am I expecting too much for my entry level equipment or could it be a lens issue? Uh, focusing shouldn't be that hard. Um, things you need to have sharp images. 
Number one, a good tripod. Um, aluminum tripods do not dampen out vibrations well. So people think carbon fiber is just for weight. Carbon fiber is very efficient for dampening out vibrations in the material. That's why they use them on aircraft. One of the main reasons is for weight and for dampening out any vibrations or fluctuation. Um, so get a good sturdy tripod and it's gonna cost money. All this stuff to get good images, unfortunately, is gonna cost a lot of money. Better gear and photography, along with growing your skills at the same time, produces better images. So what I would recommend if you have problems with your current setup and you think it's the gear that's limiting you, go rent for a weekend a really good pro body, the body that you would like dream of having, and a really good lens to go with it, and that'll automatically tell you what the failure mode is. Meaning, is it your technique or is it the gear that's holding you up? Because if you get this good gear, like a sharp lens, a really good glass, and a good body, and you start taking images with it, and they're sharp, then you know it's your gear that's failing you. So I would first do that test because you could test with your current gear and new techniques for the rest of your life and never get sharp images if it's your gear that's standing in the way. Um, so do that test first. If that doesn't work, I would say simplify your process, but I'm really gonna guess that it's probably your gear here. Nothing is better than really good sharp glass and that's the most important. You can go with a sturdy tripod that's the most important as well. And then the camera body generally doesn't matter as much, but glass and tripod are the two most important factors. So try that out first. And if that doesn't work, man, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, you can go through all my written guides and videos and go through them and see if they work for you. I really don't have enough information from just that little blurb to uh, suggest anything. Um, let's see. What is your perspective on aspiring photographers submitting their work to pro photographers for critique or various online communities they host? I don't really have a perspective on it. If you want to do it, if you feel that it helps you, go do it. I, it's not for me. Um, I like to design things in my mind and test them in real life and see if they work or they don't work. And if they work or don't work, I make changes to improve them either way. Um, I don't find that people that give these critiques often know more than the people that are submitting the critiques. The people that are giving the critiques are often just wanting to talk. I found in many circumstances where I've watched these, they like to hear themselves talk, which is what I'm doing right now. So that's, that's kind of good, right? I've been talking for 34 minutes. So maybe I like to hear myself talk, or maybe I just like to answer these questions. But as far as the critiques go, it, I, I don't really think it's going to help you more than spending that same amount of time going out and shooting, spending that same amount of time working on your editing process. And the key factor here is while you're spending that time working on it, actually think in your head, why am I not doing well at this and what steps can I do to get better? And as I take those steps, how can I make them better and better over time? So always questioning the process. And I think that's what the hard sciences and engineering really taught me is that even when you think your process is good, your process sucks and it can get better. So always improving that and it'll make you get better and better and better exponentially faster over time because you will become better and better at learning and better and better at problem solving. So I don't think those are good for me, but they might be good for you. So test it for yourself. Uh, this says, Dave, love your videos and your philosophy and your approach to photography. Do you see yourself doing this for another 5, 10, 20 years? Airplane overhead. I wonder if you have other interests you might tackle with the same enthusiasm you share with photography. Um, yes, I see myself doing this forever. Maybe not the exact same format of what I'm doing now. I try to change things on a yearly basis. But I see myself building my business. I see myself doing and like teaching others knowledge and information I see myself trying to better my own process and I see myself working for myself for the rest of my life I could not imagine going back and working for somebody else it doesn't mean that that's bad if you work for somebody else it's great in many ways meaning some people just show up to work and they're told what to do and they really enjoy like the thing they're working on and they don't have to do all the managed crap that I have to deal with like running a business but I can't see myself going back to working a nine to five or a desk job or anything where I'm being managed. I just don't take direction well from others. So I see myself working for myself 
for the rest of my life. And I see myself doing backpacking and landscape photography for the rest of my life. Those are my two or three, I should say, big drives. Working for myself, which means creating new stuff, designing new ideas, and constantly questioning what I'm doing and improving on my ideas. And then backpacking and photography. I don't see myself stopping that. Um, along with backpacking, backpacking goes any outdoor exploration, meaning rafting, mountaineering, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'm doing this long term. I don't really go halfway or um, just half ass into things. It's either like maniacal all the way or hell no, I'm not doing it. Um, so by taking that stance on things, I say no to almost everything unless it's going to be hell yes, let's do it. And then I'm going to do it as to all my potential as long as it takes for it to be successful. And I'll probably drive myself nuts along the way. Um, what else do we have here? Hi Dave, I wanted to ask you this. When you're out in the wild, aren't you scared from the wild animals during your stay here? Um, do you use a special app or website to choose your route? Those are all in the same question. I was just cutting out anything I didn't need to say there. Um, when I'm out in the wild, you don't really come, people think you're going to come in contact with a lot of wild animals that are predators. Most big predators in the North American continent are bears and wild cats. Normally, if you see a black bear or a brown bear, as long as it's not with its cubs and trying to protect itself, it's going to get away from you as fast as possible. Big cats, you're not going to hear or see a big cat unless it's on top of you trying to eat you. They're very quiet, they move quickly. Um, they are out there. In Washington, where I live, there's over 2,000 big cats, apparently. Um, I see their tracks and their cat shit all the time out on the trail. But generally, they know people well enough that you're not gonna get attacked. If you look at the statistics for all this stuff, crap, just dropped my phone. If you look at statistics, you are much more in danger crossing the street and you're much more in danger driving. You're much higher risk of dying from being overweight or being out of shape or anything else than from a wild animal if you go walking in the most wild of wilderness areas so i would highly recommend everybody if you want to go out in the wilderness take a course from a local air place like you go to rei in the united states or anywhere else that has like an introduction to backpacking course get your feet wet from that really quickly um, and then you can just go out after that maybe two or three day course and test on your own and slowly do things that you're comfortable with and then slowly increase your comfort level so you're not jumping off the edge. But there's not very many risk as far as wild animals goes. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means that the risk level is extremely, extremely low. It just happens that when it does happen, the media blows it out of proportion. The media never talks about car accidents that happen every day. They never talk about all the people dying from all the crazy diseases that are going on from obesity, from people eating bad food, from the toxicity of all different things that we come in contact with every day. But they do talk about the wild animal attacks because it, it, for some reason, gets a lot of clicks and views. So don't be too scared of that stuff. Uh, get knowledge on the things you want to become better at, become proficient, and then slowly increase what you're comfortable with so you're not jumping over that edge or that line where it becomes dangerous. And then slowly work your way into stuff you want to do. I, uh, I started getting into the wilderness expeditions and backpacking about six years ago. So it's not like it takes a whole lot of time to become highly proficient. I just am constantly looking for the next step that's going to allow me to improve myself and constantly questioning my current steps and how I can improve those to ensure that I have efficient method to get better and better over time. What else do we have? I will do a few more and then I'm going to cut it off. Um, I could do this for a long time, but it's tough to listen for this long and, and stay like tuned into something I know. So here's one that came up a lot. Hi Dave, my question is how you treat and protect your equipment out there in the rough wilderness and weather conditions. This was probably asked like five or six times, and I've been asked a lot before. I don't. Um, so it all depends on your equipment. If you have like a so-called pro body camera, uh, normally it's weather sealed and it's metal. Um, now some cameras are plastic and not weather sealed, so you should check into this, but I have a pro body, I have an Icon D810, so I can only speak for myself. I carry a lens rag for my actual lens to wipe it off when it gets wet, and then I carry another rag that soaks up more than the lens rag, more dampness I should say, and I wipe the body off after I'm done shooting if it gets wet. But it gets soaked, it gets muddy, it gets frozen, it gets dropped, it gets beat up. So generally I don't really do much for it except clean it off with that towel 
after it gets wet or muddy and I store it each night so it's clean and ready to go for the next day. So it's kind of like a tool in a workshop. You just clean it off, get it ready for the next day, but I don't bag it up or take care of it in any special considerations. Um, I don't keep it in like a waterproof sack or anything and it lasts really long. These bodies are pretty tough so I don't have any problem with really putting it to use. I don't ever want to use something to protect it that will kind of keep me from getting the best shots possible. And if I put like a plastic bag over it or a bunch of protectors on it, then I can't efficiently take photos and I can't constantly improve my actual photography. So I don't worry about that stuff. Um, I just clean it at the end of the day. So that's a great question. But I treat my gear like crap, essentially, and it still lasts. I normally get five or six years out of a camera body before it dies. Um, let's see. Let's go over a few last ones that I want to end with. Number one is drones, and the number two is sharing photo locations. So drones are becoming rampant. Everybody's starting to get into drones, and I always get the question, why don't you shoot with drones? Now, drones are an interesting one, because a lot of people, for some reason, have an emotional tie to them, it seems. Like, if you tell people they can't use a drone somewhere, they freak out. Um, I'm not sure why this is, but where I go, where I backpack, uh, where I take photos is the wilderness, meaning it's not touched by noises from the outside world. It's not, there's no traffic, there's no roads, there's no shops, stores, people, anything else. It's supposed to just be left alone, untouched wild. When I go in there, I'm a guest or a visitor. So I do everything possible to be as quiet as possible and to be as unseen as possible. I don't leave any trash out there. I take all the toilet paper I might use. I take all the trash that I create, which I try not to create much, and I leave no trace out in the wild. Now, this also goes along with leaving the trace of noise. Drones are very noisy. They make a lot of noise to the surrounding animals. You might disrupt their breeding patterns. You might disrupt their mating patterns, whatever else they're doing. But the biggest downfall that I find with drones is that they are going to keep you from pushing your limits of exploring places that you can reach on foot. So you could fly a drone up 2,000 feet to the top of a peak and see a really cool view. Or you could learn all the skill sets it takes to climb up there and get a background knowledge and a connection with the wild that you wouldn't get otherwise. And that's a connection that I think everybody is missing out on. You also, upon climbing up to the top of that peak, get a view and a photo that will be more worthwhile to you than anything that you could ever get by flying a drone up there to get it from that same viewpoint. So you, by using drones, you're limiting your feet movement, you're limiting your ability to do all these things by hand, you're limiting your physical ability, and you're also possibly destructing things that are left should be left alone out there in nature. The last issue I have with drones in the wilderness environment is that if, you, if somebody wrecks a drone somewhere that's hard to get, let's say they're flying a drone up on this cliff face they can't climb up on, if they wreck it up there, they're going to leave it up there. So these batteries are going to start to decompose and drip down. Lithium ion is going to drip down all over this natural area and really destroy what's there. And all that plastic is going to be left there. So if you want to fly drones in the city where it's already noisy, if you want to fly drones in approved places, where you should be allowed to fly drones, go for it. There's airplane that just flew over me here. It's much louder than a drone. But drones in the wilderness do not mix, and I just don't like drones because I want to go out there and have the experience, the tactile experience with touching my feet on the ground, touching my hands on rocks, climbing, uh, hiking, running, and just feeling what it's like to be pushing your body to the limits and using what you're given as far as physical ability and training and all the effort that goes into it to create images that way and it's something that makes me more excited than anything else on the planet so drone kind of takes away from that um the last thing i want to touch on is sharing locations sharing locations in the wild sharing locations as far as gps coordinates online it's something i never do so if you want to get into photography and you want to find locations to shoot there are a million popular locations that have already been posted online. You can see what's happened to them. They become overrun with tourists. They become destroyed. The nature gets screwed up. The ecology of the whole area gets destroyed because it wasn't designed through evolution and progression of the natural earth to take a load of thousands of people on a tour bus every day. So there's already tons of spots for new photographers to go. 
I don't feel that there's any need to share new locations with photographers. When you're getting into photography, you can go to these hot spots. That's fine. That's a good place to learn. It's a good place to hone your compositions. It's a good place to get better. But once you get to a level in landscape and outdoor photography where you have your skills, you've dialed in your compositions, you're going to want places that you don't know about to go adventure, to go explore, to go find on your own. And if everybody shares all these good places online and everything's indexed on the internet, there's not going to be places left for new outdoorsmen, new photographers, new wilderness adventurers to go explore because it's all going to be shared already and it's all going to be ruined by mass visits. So when I don't share locations, it's not because I'm trying to be selfish. It's because I don't want them to be ruined for future generations that want to come out and do true wilderness and backcountry travel. If I share them, not only does the nature get damaged, which I don't want to happen, but there won't be places for future generations to come and find on their own and be excited when they find them without being shared this GPS online. Because let me tell you, I don't ever, I do all my scouting and planning for trips on my own now just by studying topo maps. And all the places I find that are the best places I've ever been, I've never seen them shared online. They're more beautiful than those places that are shared online. They're better than any hotspot you've ever seen shared on a photography website. And what makes them really connect with me so much is that I've found them. I know other people have been there before, but not many. But I found them on my own just by researching and putting in the miles with my legs and training to get better at my physical endurance so I could get there. And that whole process of going through everything required to get there and then taking a photo there makes that photo mean so much more to me. And I don't want to remove that experience for future generations. If everything's shared and everybody shares all these hot spots, then that's going to be gone and there will be no more wilderness exploration. So when you're going to share a location, think about not only what it will do to the environment, if a lot of people visit, because they will, the potential is there. If you share a link online, it can be shared with a million people very quickly. Think about the environment. And then think about the future generations of photographers that won't get to have the moment that you're having right now by finding that spot and it being unfound by the masses. Nobody will get that experience. So just think about those two things. You could take your friends there, but just be very careful in how you share these pristine locations because they will become overrun and they will become destroyed very quickly. So I'm not trying to be selfish with the locations. I just want the future generations of photographers that want the exploration and the wilderness experience to have a place to go and explore. And that's just something that I'm really happy that exists for my generation, and I hope it exists for the future generations as well. So that's my background on drones and sharing locations in wilderness. So hopefully those answers helped you guys. I will probably come back in the middle of the summer and do another Q&A session. There's a whole lot more questions that I'd love to answer for you guys, but this is at 50 minutes right now. So I will let you guys go. Um, I will be back in, I don't know when I'll be back next. I have a lot of backpacking and photography to do right now. I really appreciate you guys tuning in for this past season of videos that I put out. It's always a huge challenge for me to put them out. Um, I'm always pushing my creative and mental efforts to do so. And just to have you guys show up and comment and interact and like all the good relationships I built with everybody has been really enjoyable. I appreciate you guys for being here and watching these videos and I will come out with a new kind of project. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet, but I will think about it over the next few months of backpacking and photography and I will let you guys know. So thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate you watching. It means a lot. See you guys in a few months. Bye.